Hello students. Today we're going to start a three-part series that deals with measurements and calculations. All right, now notice I didn't say measurements and calculations in science class because at some point in time in, in your life, now, future, you are going to be making measurements in some aspect of your life. It might be uh, that you're going to put in a new window in a house and you have to measure the opening. Uh, you darn well want to make sure that you measure that correctly before you order the window. Maybe uh, you plan on getting into the medical field and you're going to be a nurse and you need to make sure that you're delivering the correct dosage of medicine. There's all kinds of ways that we can relate measurements and calculations to actions that you're going to take in your life. All right, so the three things that we're going to look at would be percent error, significant figures, and then scientific notation. Before we begin that, let's just kind of review real quick. When we were finishing up our last video series, we were looking at the scientific method. Scientific method always starts out with some observation. You're, you're observing something. You're asking a question. And out of that, you're going to have some sort of quantitative or qualitative measurements that you're going to have to take and observe, measure something. You're going to observe something, describe something. You'll do some research based on what you saw, what you observed, what you're questioning. You'll have some sort of hypothesis, that educated guess, but it's got to be something that's going to be testable, that if-then, right? We'll perform our experiments to gather information to see whether the hypothesis is valid. And then you have to always make sure that you analyze that information. Did I make any errors? Errors, remember, our first part of this video ser series, we're going to look at percent error. So we're going to analyze that data, look at the errors that happened, look that occurred. And then we're going to draw some conclusions from that and then communicate your results. So that's the scientific method. All right, now what if you find something to be uh, overall true through your observations and it tries to explain something that uh, is going on, all right? We would describe that as a, a theory. It's a set of tested hypotheses. You know, you observe something, you've, you've made an educated guess, and you see the same thing happening over and over and over, like plate tectonics, all right? Plate tectonics, it's kind of hard to dispute that because you're looking at evidence did you see the plates move and shift around? No, but the continents, they match up. Fossil records, they match up. You see uh, the mid-Atlantic rift occurring. All of those things support that theory, that model. On the other hand, if you are looking at a law, a law is the same observation that's going to be applying every single time. So the law of conservation of mass in the chemistry half of the year. If we do a lab experiment, you're not going to create and destroy matter. right? If we have a chemical reaction occurring, you're going to end up with the same amount of mass after the reaction as what you had before the reaction. All right? The law of gravity, you can see that. All right? you, can, you can mathematically describe what's going to happen. Now, Kind of a way that we can uh, summarize this. Uh, a law summarizes what happens. It's got some math, right? Then a theory is just an attempt to explain why that happens. All right. Our two types of measurements. Now we're on to our measurements here. Okay. So this is the new stuff. Measurements, we're going to make sure that we're always looking at the units on everything that we do. All right, so all units are calibrated against the standard that has been adopted by the Committee of the International System of Units, the SI units. So you're looking at mass, all right, kilograms. You're looking at volume, liters. If we're looking at distance, you're talking about meters. So there are two types of measurements that we can, we, we can come up with. We have ones that are called fundamental measurements. Now that is a definition. That is a definition that's going to come up later, so you need to make sure that you really remember what fundamental measurements are, and you need to remember what derived measurements are as well. 
So what exactly is a fundamental measurement? Well, a fundamental measurement is a measurement that you simply just look at an instrument and then you can read the number on it. So if we had a graduated cylinder here, we have our meniscus and you have all your little calibrated markings on here. Okay, and this measurement right here, you determine this to be 21.0 milliliters. Okay, remember, units go on to everything, right? So if that's 21.0 milliliters, you didn't have to do any math to come up with that measurement. That's a fundamental measurement. If you're looking at distance, how far is it if we're measuring the distance from the top to the bottom of the graduated cylinder here, well, if that distance right there is 30.2 centimeters, I, I would use a meter stick to measure that distance, and I don't have to use any math to measure that out. So fundamental measurements are those measurements that you just look at a calibrated instrument, read the number, and write it down. So what would be a derived measurement on the other hand. A derived measurement uses some math to figure out your numbers. All right, so where would we see something like a derived measurement? All right, if you're in your car and you're driving along in your, your car and you're, you're going a speed of 25 miles per hour, well, you have math that's going to be involved here. You're taking two fundamental measurements. Distance is fundamental. I can measure out 25 miles. All right. Time is a fundamental measurement. I can look at a clock and then tell what time it is or how much time has passed. But for us to look at speed, you have to combine two fundamental measurements together. So when we divide those two things together, that is showing a derived measurement. Another example of a derived measurement might be density. So if we have density, you have to take two different measurements to figure out how much matter is packed into a given space. You have to know what the mass of the object is. So you're going to have to have your triple beam balance. You get how much mass is contained in an object. And then you have to take a second measurement you have to measure the volume. How much matter is packed into a given space? Two fundamental measurements put together makes a derived measurement. All right, so remember what those two terms are. All right, next, if we're looking at the nature of measurements, what you should have noticed so far is those quantitative observations always has two things associated with it. All of those numbers that I wrote down, I had the first part, I had a value. I had a quantity. I said that it was 31.0 centimeters. All right. I said that the volume was 21.0 uh, milliliters. All right. That's a number. All right. But the second part, and I didn't even mean to do this, it's just natural, you have to have a scale or a unit associated with it. So this scale or this unit, I automatically put down centimeters. I automatically put down milliliters because I want you to see what the calibrated markings are. What kind of instrument did I use? Did I use a meter stick? Did I use... Uh, uh, let's say a micrometer. What what instrument did you use to measure 31? All right. Was it 31 feet? 31 miles with no unit of measurement, you're not really getting an accurate picture of what you're looking at. All right. Now, whenever you're making these measurements, especially if you're in shop class, I don't think your shop teacher will ever tell you measure once and then cut twice. That's just wasteful. All right. So what they're going to do is they're going to tell you to measure twice, cut once. Why? Because there's uncertainty in the measurements that you're going to take. No one is perfect. All right. So if we're trying to get a, 
a idea or wrap our head around this idea of that all of our measurements are going to have some degree of uncertainty, we need to look at how we address that. All right. So we try to find instruments that are going to be of higher calibrated markings. If you were to look at trying to determine which one of these instruments would be better in measuring mass. Well, the one in the middle, that's going to measure to one place past the decimal point. All right. So the triple beam balance on the left hand side, that's always going to be able to measure to two places past the decimal point. And then if you have a digital one, you could measure three or four or five places past the decimal point. So which one is going to reduce your uncertainty? Which one is going to be more precise? It's the one with a greater number of digits that is going to be able to be recorded. All right. But you have to understand that no instrument is going to have an infinite number of decimal places past it. There's always going to be some level of uncertainty, some error associated with your numbers. All right. So when you're measuring these numbers, you have two terms that we have to keep in mind. All right. Accuracy. How accurate, how correct are your numbers? All right. Accuracy refers to the agreement of a particular value which is true. All right. A good example of something that would be accurate is we're, if we're trying to describe how many inches are in a foot. We know with absolute certainty that there's going to be 12 inches in a foot, right? That's, that's an accurate representation, all right? But if you were going to measure those 12 inches, are you going to have the exact same measurement on your wood that you're cutting, let's say, every single time? Well, maybe your tape measure, it's, it wasn't printed right. Maybe your meter stick, you bang the end of the wood into the ground and it's damaged the end. So you may come up with the same number. You might say that it's 12 inches every single time, but maybe it's off by a little bit, right? You might be precise, but you're not accurate with the, the measurements you're taking, all right? So just a graphic to help explain this. If we are measuring things and we relate it to us, you know, shooting some arrows at a target. The one on the left hand side, would you describe that as accurate? Accuracy is like hitting the bullseye. That's not accurate. All right. Now those three shots, are they grouped up together? Are they precise? No, they're separated. So that's neither precise nor accurate. This would be a good example of somebody that's going to get a triple beam balance out, not zero the thing out, and then just look at the numbers real quick and then never look at it a second time, okay? The one in the middle, it's not accurate, but you see that all of the arrows are grouped closely together. So that would be an example of poor accuracy, but good precision. And then the last one on the right-hand side, if we're looking at accuracy, it's right on the bullseye, so that's accurate. They're grouped up together, so that's high precision. All right. Now, when we're looking at those measurements, those arrows that were being shot at it, there's two types of errors that you can come up with. You have things that are called random errors. Now, these random errors are unpredictable changes in the experiment. Maybe uh, what you're looking at is uh, let's say that there's an environmental change. You're trying to measure the temperature uh, of something and the temperature in the room starts to fluctuate. The air conditioning kicks on. Somebody opens up a window and then all the heat rushes in and it causes a change in your measurements. All right. So that would be an example of a, a random error. And you have an equal probability of these measurements uh, being too high or too low. There's there's no set specific value that when the air conditioning kicks on, that your measurement is always going to be under by two degrees. It, it, it's never going to be the exact same thing. All right. So another example of a random error, it might just simply be one person to another. They're looking at how far something's measured on a meter stick 
and they both read it differently. If you're looking at a graduated cylinder, not everybody's going to agree on where that line is actually at. So you just have some in, insufficient information for random errors. There's something off there, all right? Now, what can help that is if you start to repeat your, your measurements, that can help reduce the random errors that you, that you get. So that's why in shop class, they say measure twice. It helps to reduce those random errors, all right? But random errors, you, you can't completely eliminate them. You can reduce them by redoing the experiment several times, but you're never going to get rid of that completely. All right. Uh, let's take a look at the next one. If you're looking at the next type of error that you could come across, it's called a systematic error. All right. Systematic errors usually occur because there's some sort of flaw that is in your experimental design. You know, you, you have something set up wrong. Or maybe, maybe it's your instrument, right? You're, if you're using a triple beam balance and you don't zero that thing out, guess what? You're going to be off by the exact same amount every single time. That's poor technique. You didn't measure the thing out right. You didn't zero it out right, all right? Uh, let's say another example of a systematic error that you're going to get the same amount off just about every single time that you look at this is if you're reading the volume in a graduated cylinder. If you're measuring it at the top of that curved line of your meniscus, you're going to be off by the exact same amount every single time in that particular graduated cylinder. So that would be, again, poor technique. You're not measuring it at the bottom of the meniscus like you should be. Now that we know what our types of error that we have, how do we account for it? Well, this is our first formula. You need some math to uh, account for these errors. So I would recommend that you start your formula sheet right now. Your formula sheet, you're going to be able to use on any homework any quiz, any test on the exam, but you have to start keeping the formula sheet and you want to make sure that it's nice and clean. All right, so our first formula that we're going to look at is how do we account for these errors? We can't just dismiss it. We have to analyze uh, what we're doing wrong. We have to figure it out. So we need some measurements. We need some numbers. The first number that we're going to look at right here is the what they call the experimental. This is your measurement. You take that. All right. The literature is what we know to be true. All right. So I'm going to put known to be true. And then we subtract those two values. And then we're going to divide it by, again, the known value. You're going to notice in the numerator, you have these as the absolute values. You're going to find just about in every single uh, textbook those absolute value markers. But personally, I choose to leave them off. And you're going to see why in just a little bit. All right. Because if you take those absolute values of the, the, percent error, what's going to happen is you're not going to know if you are above or below what the literature is. You'll know how far off you are, but if you take the absolute value and you get rid of the negative, the negative says that I am under, my measurement would be under what it should be. So I personally like to dismiss those absolute values. All right, so let's see this in action. We have Julie determines the density of copper to be 8.25 grams per cubic centimeter. Well, first off, let's let's do a reminder. This, is that a fundamental measurement or is that a derived measurement? We have two values, grams, cubic centimeters. That's going to be a derived. All right, it says find the percent error if the actual density of copper is 8.92 grams per cubic centimeter. Well, what I have here is 
I have Julie measured this. That goes into the your part of the formula. We know that the density of copper is 8.92. That goes right here. We will take that value, subtract them. Now, again, the textbook will tell you to take the absolute value of it. Divide by the known times 100, and you come up with 7.51%. Now, why, why, why do I say that I choose to dismiss those absolute values? If I told you that Julie measured her density of copper and was off by 7.51%, is that telling you that she measured it under the actual or over the actual? See, if we got rid of those absolute values, what we would see is that we'd have a percent error of negative 7.51%. Now, what this negative here does is it tells us that she measured it under what the value should have been. All right? So that's why I, again, that's why I personally choose to leave the negatives on if they're there. What you're going to have now will be a couple of problems where you have to figure out your own percent errors of different uh, lab situations. There will be a homework help uh, page for you or video that's going to be uh, ready. And inside of that video, what you'll, find, what you'll find is I'm going to show you how to set up every single problem. I'm going to show you that when you're working these problems out, you just can't put an answer down. I don't want to see just an answer because all that tells me is that you probably just copied from somebody else. You didn't do the work. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to be giving you the answers. The thing that I want to see is I want to see how you work out the problems. The process is every bit, if not more important than the product. Okay, so you have to show that process part, all right? That's what you need to learn how to do this year is you've got to show the work. You have to share the information out with somebody of what you did, how you did it. So that way you can go back if you need to and see what you did, what you can improve on. And if you just put an answer down, that's pointless, all right? So uh, get that done, get it turned in, ask questions if you need to. All right, take care.